go to the Lord in prayer, we definitely, uh, you know, we're, we're here. We want to hear what God's got to say, what he's got to say to each of us. So let's just open our hearts and our mind to, to hear him. Father, we appreciate, as, as always, we appreciate the opportunity to be here, the freedom we have to be here. And Lord, that the assurance, the absolute confidence we have that you are here. We know you're with us at all times, but there's special times, Lord, when we come into your presence. And Lord, as we come into your presence now, we ask that you would help us to be receptive to what you say to us, to hear your word, your voice, Lord, as you encourage us, as you correct us, and as you instruct us. We just give this time into your hands and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you are going to do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, a couple of things before we start with the rich young ruler. Uh, I've got a, uh, I guess blog is the best way to call it. I want to share with you, and then I want to uh, refer to that question I left you with last week. How is Jesus able to minister Jairus' daughter while he was not clean? And the next day the Lord gave me some things insight into that. So let's start out with this. This is uh, something that as I read it, I really felt the Lord wanted me to share it with you. The title is Showdown with the Witch Doctor, Turning the Tables on the Devil. So this is a basically a testimony, if you would. It's by Chad McDonald. It was published uh, the June the 2nd. Uh, Chad McDonald is a founder of Revival Fire World Ministries. He travels throughout this country and internationally uh, in revival meetings. He's also the host of the Voice of Revival, just to give you an idea of who we're talking about. Okay, now, this is his uh, story, his sharing. It had been a long week of ministry in Haiti. From, you know, Hades at the island down around Cuba. The Miracle Crusade had been a powerful success. Many were born again, scores were healed, and the delivering power of God was manifest as throngs were set free from demon power. Now that, that sentence there pretty much sums up his ministry. Very active in, in miracles and healings and so forth. You know, real demonstration of the Spirit's power. Okay. An unexpected invitation had come in near the week's end. I had been so graciously invited to travel to the summit of a mountain region located north of Port Au Prince. One of the pastors had invited me to trek to his village and so graciously asked if I would preach the Sunday service. Now, this is after the week of, of uh, ministry there at Port uh, Prince. Now, it had not been on my set itinerary for the week. Nonetheless, I accepted and began the long, arduous journey that Saturday up the mountainside. <clears throat> the terrain was so rough and the incline so steep that the donkeys were outpacing our automobile. <coughs> the location was so rural and remote that I began to ask the Lord if anyone even lived on this mountaintop. It seemed we barely even passed any of the population during the climb. Once I crested the mountaintop, to my surprise, it opened up to a beautiful plateau dotted with villages and an humble rural church. We made it to the church just prior to nightfall, quickly were led into our sleeping quarters to get some rest and be prepared for the service the following day. <clears throat> Suddenly, at about 7 p.m., a great commotion erupted. There were drums <coughs> rhythmically banging, dancing, and shouting. It literally caused the plywood walls of our quarters to shake and seemed so close. 
I quickly stepped outside to be greeted by the pastor's son. What's going on, I asked. His response, a voodoo ceremony. It sounded so close, almost as if it was coming from the church sanctuary. The witch doctor lives next door. Do you want to see, he offered. I was furious. Absolutely came my response, and we walked across the sanctuary and stood on the threshold where we watched as the entire village was assembled about 40 feet away in the backyard of the voodoo prince. A little bit of uh, uh, perspective here, probably the length of the building, a little bit more, maybe from here to the middle of the highway is how close this was. <clears throat> I asked the Lord, do you want me to go over there? His response was swift, no, go lay down. Tonight they're calling on their gods. In the morning, you will call on me and I will answer by fire. Kind of like the back of your neck stand up, right? The following morning, just as the service began, a report came. The witch doctor was sitting on his porch next door, only feet away, and had begun to make incantations in an attempt to thwart <clears throat> what God was doing. Yet, even then, he was powerless to stop it. And I cast demons out of two young women. Thank you all in the service. I finally had enough. I, get my fingers going here. I looked over with the, the witch doctor and released the word of the Lord. And he spoke. Witch doctor, the hand of the Lord is surely against you and he shall drive you from this mountaintop. I wrapped up the service that morning and climbed in my waiting vehicle headed back to Port uh, Prince. I had not thought much of that incident until I was back in Haiti the following year and once again, received an invitation to return to that very mountain. As we arrived, my friend the pastor began to show me around and was so very proud of all the renovations they had made since my visit only a year before. <clears throat> then suddenly, without hesitation, he led me through the very doorway from where one year ago we'd watched that terrible voodoo ceremony. Yet we didn't stop. Soon we were walking onto the adjacent property. My friend then led me inside what was once the voodoo priest home. I stopped and asked, where did the witch doctor go? To this day, I can still hear the word of that pastor's voice as he responded, I don't know. He just disappeared. And this is a year later. Immediately, I was quickened by the Spirit as he spoke to me. The Lord spoke to him and said, Not one word you speak in my name will fall to the ground void. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Not only did the Lord drive that worker of iniquity from the mountaintop, he gave the church, the witch doctor's entire property. And then he speaks to us. It is now past time that we stop allowing the enemy to harass and assault our lives. Now's the time to turn the tables. <clears throat> Straighten up your back, stomp your foot, point your finger in the face of the devil, and command him to put it back. This is your season for divine turnaround. <clears throat> that really, that's it, really uh, spoke to me, and I felt like I needed to share that. Oh, wow. Wow. It's uh, pretty powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty powerful. Wow. I, I really, the more I read and study and get older, I guess, the more I think the Lord's got a real sense of humor that the witch doctor's property now belongs to the church. <laughs> you know? I mean, you read in the Old Testament where, where the Lord mocked mock the, the, the uh, and I'm not talking about like, you know, one of the prophets, but it says the Lord mocked them. You know, they raise up their fists against me and I laugh at them. 
you know, he, they, they abuse him sometimes. Yeah. But that, that's almost, you know, adding insult to injury when the, not only the witch doctor gone, but his property is now part of the church property, you know? That's pretty cool. Uh-huh. Okay. And I mentioned last week, uh, uh, when we were basically closing, uh, how was Jesus able to minister Jairus' daughter while unclean? <clears throat> Did anyone have uh, some input on that? Well, I'm very pleased. I don't hear anything, but I don't see any glazed looks either, you know, <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm optimistic there. What I understood after the fact, being unclean was a ritual purity, which mean, meant you could not enter any place where God was because that would show disrespect for God. You know, he's pure. So you couldn't go in, you couldn't go into the synagogue or the temple. But it didn't affect your relationship with the Holy Spirit. In other words, you... You needed to be right before you went in to worship, but it didn't mean that you couldn't do anything else. That's, that's what the Lord brought to my thoughts. So Jesus ministered. It doesn't say anything about him going to the synagogue or temple area, and it wasn't the Sabbath anyway. So he had plenty of time to get, uh, you know, to, be, to bathe and become ritually clean before the Sabbath. But that's, that's what the Lord uh, put in my thoughts. Okay. <clears throat> we will move now to the rich young ruler. And I'll read the Matthew 19, like we did last time. <clears throat> and in the notes, you know the... Uh, the Greek word, I've got the translation there, Greek word for life is Zoe, and it's throughout any time. I, I don't want to get too carried away with that, but in, throughout this dialogue and in most passages that deal with eternal life, they use the Greek word Zoe, Z-O-E. Um, there's other words for life, which, you know, refers to the, maybe the physical life or something, but throughout this, it's a, the Greek word zoe. And also, uh, just a reminder for us, when it, the translation says perfect, you've got to look at the, the uh, context, but generally that means complete, mature, uh, that type of thing, not uh, where you have no imperfection. Okay, <clears throat> okay so, Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. <clears throat> and as uh, mentioned there, uh, Mark 10 and Luke 18 are parallel passages. So Matthew 19, begin in verse 16. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing or good shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> The young man said to him, All these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when the young man had heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. <coughs> okay, so... This, uh, we've got uh, four things to consider. Let's take those uh, one at a time and just kind of, you know, whatever insight you want to share on that. It all deals with eternal life. There's quite a bit more here than just eternal life, but that was the question that the man posed. So 
Uh, and I'd like for us, in this little difficult, um, I'd like for us to stay, uh, well, I guess I'll just read my notes and make it easier for me. Everything in Scripture is connected in some manner. You know, we know that. We accept that. Everything from Genesis to Revelation, there's threads all through it. Not just one, but several. So let's try to confine ourselves to the issues specific to the Scripture under discussion. Because we could take eternal life and we could spend a month in Genesis and the rest of the year in Revelation. You know, so let's... Uh, and again, I know that's that's putting some constraints on us, but uh, because everything is connected. All right, so let's start with the first one. How does one get eternal life? And one of the passages uh, for reference was uh, Luke 10 and then Ezekiel 18. So, we'll just do this. Okay, from Scripture. And again, you know, we've got a lot of things we know and we've been taught and so forth. But let's stick with basically what Scripture says here. So, how does one get eternal life? Because that was, you know, I mean, that's pretty key. That's what this guy's asking, isn't it? What do I do? And we're going to break that down a little more because the way he brought it up brings up some questions, but that's okay. So what do we do? How does one get eternal life? That's a question. That's not rhetorical. That's a... Out there, obey the commandments. Obey the commandments. I have, I have a question. Just a minute here. Believe on the yeah. Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, what were you saying? Somebody? Oh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Romans 10, 4 says, Christ is the end of the law. The law leads up to him who is the fulfillment of its type. And in him, the purpose which it was designed to accomplish is fulfilled. Okay. Um, Okay, big commandments, uh, believe on Christ. Any other input on eternal life? Yes, sir. On the, uh, everybody's heard of the Ten Commandments. So all other laws by the Jews are called commandments also? Some are. It kind of depends on the person, you know. Uh, but in general, the, uh, the Jews see a... a I think it's 162 commandments in the Old Testament. Because there's quite a few things that are commanded. We we focus on the 10. But there's 162 of them. <laughs> One of them, uh, and this is something we'll probably do in the future, is look at the uh, commandments. You know, is one greater than another? The Jews consider, I think it's in Exodus, I can't tell you the reference. But there's a commandment that says, when you come up on a, a bird on a nest, you can take the eggs, but don't take the mother. They consider that one of the least of the commandments. But that is a, they consider that a commandment. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't take the bird and the eggs. So to answer your question, it, they see it and I think Jesus would be in the same position here because we're taking this from the position that he is a Jewish rabbi. Everything we've seen points to that. So he's going to, fo uh, he's going to function in the same manner 
that they would. Now, he's got a little different message, but still he's working off the same uh, commandments, if you would. Now, he, he tells them just those six commandments, you know, because he says which ones. And, you know, well, he, he rattles off, well, he uses the word rattle for Jesus, but he names six commandments. Right? So, and that's what he tells him. And I gave you that reference for Luke 10. Same thing. The lawyer stood up, teacher of what should I do to inherit eternal life? Eternal life. And Jesus said what's written in the law, and then he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, all your mind, and your neighbors yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. Those are different commandments, aren't they? They're different commandments. But what he, what the lawyer <clears throat> quoted was kind of a summary of the Ten Commandments. You know, because one, at one place they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? You know, and, and that's when we talk about the yoke of a rabbi, that's what we, we talk about. He said, you know, uh, I'm going blank. Love the Lord, you know, your, your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and your neighbors yourself. So the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So, you know, it's kind, okay. of, kind of funny though. He answered him and then he tried to wiggle out of it. And he says, well, um, in that case, who's my neighbor? He's trying to narrow the scope of who he has to love. And that, you know, that's... Uh, <clears throat> I think that's what the rich, young person is trying to do too is where's the loophole right right we'll come to that in just a little bit here because we that's a good thing to develop a good thing to develop where this guy was coming where this young man was coming from so <clears throat> eternal life okay how we get it now let's go to anything else on this yes sir I'm sorry? Relationship with Jesus. Relationship, right. Relationship. <clears throat> Let me put that up here. Boy, oh my. turning them upside down, that'll help. If I leave them like that, it'll be so strong I can't get it off the board. It's one of them flip, flop, flip, <laughs> flop things. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, this young man. Now he said, all these have I done since my youth. You know, I'm, and I'm putting all three trans uh, the parallel passages together. So, if he's done that already, is he, does he have eternal life now? I mean, you know, at the time he's asking. Well, Jesus told him to do something else too, didn't he? He did. He did. He said, um, where is that? Uh, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Mm -hmm. And then when he said, which ones? If you said, you know, okay, am I going to do them all? <coughs> and he, he gave him those six mm -hmm. of the ten. And <clears throat> the implication up to this point is, <clears throat> that's all he needed to do. You know, you take that as his answer. We'll get into, because it can get a little tricky here in a little bit. 
when we get down to the other part of this, and we really, you know, it's it's hard not to get into it right now, but we can we can kind of miss a lot if we. At least that's my take on it. Oh, Donna. He was really offering him more. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what we're going to get to when we come to number three. What else is there besides eternal life? Is there anything else? See, that's, that's where we're, we're working up to that. But right now, does young man have eternal life already? Well, but for them... It was based on the atone, the sacrifice and the sending out every year, once a year, that scapegoat. And that's what they looked at. That was to cover the sins of the Jewish people, right? Is when they did that, the sacrifice and they... Yeah, that was for the nation. The nation. Right. But, then they, but they considered themselves, I think, as one, didn't they? And if you received and you believed in that, then you... you... As, as a nation, the, the, the Day of Atonement and stuff, individuals came at different times. You know, I really missed it. You know, I need to get right with God. Uh, and there's other sacrifices that are just worship sacrifices but there is the the guilt offering and or the guilt sacrifice and the uh, sin sacrifice for the individual and then like Abraham Abraham was righteous because of faith even before the commandments came well you know this is where so I don't know how we could say is he is, does he have eternal life then or not because by what they looked at <laughs> And, and again, we're looking at what Jesus is saying here. What did he say to the the uh, uh, lawyer, you know, in Luke? He told him, you know, said, well, how do you read it? You know, what? And you know, the lawyer said, you know, you do this, this, and this. And he said, you've answered correctly. So, If we break it down to, if you're not um, in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that means that all of those in the Old Testament didn't have eternal life. Okay? Because, and, and this is something not for us to get into right now, but... Jesus fulfilled the law. The law had its problems, but from Genesis, the righteous shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul will find no pleasure in him. That's Old Testament and New Testament. Faith. Faith. So, you know, it can get kind of confusing after a while because we, we teach certain things. Uh, we tend to focus exclusively on the New Testament and on Christ. But it all hangs together. That's something I haven't seen until recently. So, uh, we've got something more than they had. And that's what he was, you know, the final thing, and I'm, and I'm, I'm straying here, uh, but that's what we need to sort out. We need to sort this out. Because we tend to lump it all together. And, you know, if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. Is Enoch in hell? You know, I mean, come on. Is Enoch in hell? We don't think so. He may not be in seventh heaven, but he's not in hell because God took him. So, you know, some of this stuff, because we're digging. We're not taking the uh, usual Sunday school stuff or, you know, uh, Sinner's Prayer or any of that. We're, we're getting past that. Yes, sir? Well, I, as I recall, uh, in the New Testament, where after Jesus died, he went into paradise. All those in paradise was the saints from the Old Testament 
and he gave them an opportunity to know him while he was in paradise. There are several scriptures, actually not just one, but more than one, that refer to that. Yeah. There's some that, uh, you know, and, and Jesus says that uh, there's going to be Abraham. I can't remember who else he says. Will be at the wedding feast. Mm -hmm. They'll be sitting at the wedding feast. So, you know, this is before. They did, the Messiah really wasn't much of a concept until we had the law. So up until the time of the law, time of Moses, like like um, Job, or how about Melchizedek? You know, you see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to tear down anything that we believe, but we need to look a little deeper in what we believe. In fact, also, paradise was considered Abraham's bosom. Some make that leap. I think, I don't think, it, and that's, see, that's kind of where we get into some of this stuff that's not, it doesn't specifically say that. We make well, the you assumption. Know the, you know, the rich man that died and went to hell, right. he looked up into Abraham's bosom and asked Father Abraham to send the, uh, the, uh, the man that died, the, the poverty guy. Right. Yeah, the so, Lazarus. And they right. considered, that's where, where people get the idea that it's considered Abraham's bosom as well. Right. And Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say heaven. If you look at the Greek, yeah. paradise is not heaven. It was the waiting place. Uh, Probably. It could have been Abraham's have bosom. Been. You know what we call that. We yeah. don't know. And that, See, that's where we get... And there's nothing wrong with looking at it that way. <coughs> But what you know? What do we know for a fact is there are people that's got eternal life. Where? I don't know. Uh, you know, some. If, well, I've, I've always heard the teaching that paradise was the waiting place. When Jesus went into there, he took them back to heaven with him. Those that were in paradise. In the medieval uh, era, you know, uh, Middle Ages, back in the you know. Renaissance times and stuff like that. Limbo was a concept that came up. They still talk about it, particularly in the Catholic Church. It's a holding place. Limbo. You're not here, you're not there. You're in limbo. And we've got a lot of things that we make out of all of that. I don't know. But I would say one thing. I would rather be with Lazarus than with the rich man. Amen. Okay? Amen. You know, what the specific difference is stuff, I think we, we can't say it says specifically right here. Okay, you know, just a minute. Just, yes, ma'am. This maybe doesn't tie, but to me it does. The word says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word mm -hmm. made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The okay, Father right. The only begotten of the Father. Jesus was with God in the beginning. They served God. Mm -hmm. You know, so I believe they're born again when they're serving Him by faith. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus came as Christ. Christ. As Christ. Right. Yes, later right. on. But I believe, you right. know, those in the Old Testament knew God. They were looking and forward to the Messiah. Yes. They were looking forward to the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, uh, what I'm saying, the rich man in hell had always since. Now, how do you know he was in hell? Because he said he looked up out of hell. He was in torment. Did what? He was in torment. He was in torment. Yeah. We call that hell. Uh, there's the word Gehenna, Sheol, yeah, sure. hell. It's a you know, it's a it's, that, was, that was hell. We yeah. tend to think that place of tor torment with the flame. We tend to put that as the same place as the lake of fire. <laughs> And it could have been but you, you could, there's a lot of reasons to say it's not because that doesn't right. typically happen until after the judgment. Right. So, but the lake of fire probably exists before then. Yeah. You know, again, so we've we've made we've taken some of this stuff and you know maybe gotten a little askew. I'm not saying we're wrong. Well, it doesn't imply that he was in pain. What's that? It doesn't imply that he was in pain or in torment. 
which is pain. Right, right. Yeah. He's not having a good time. He's not having a good time. He's not having a good time. It's interesting, though, isn't it? That, and this, <laughs> we're, he's going to be there forever or something similar. We know that. So, thinking about that, he has, and you know, this is something also that we have to be a little careful with. That was an illustration. Is it an actual happening? I don't know. It's a story. He told them the story. It's like this, the sword, you know, so you see it's something that could happen. We don't know. Well, most people believe it happened. Right? Yeah. And there's a lot of people who believe there's no baptism of the Holy Spirit today, too. Yeah. I, and I, I'm not trying to put you down on that, but just because people believe it. We talk from the pulpit. We say how the church has fallen away. Well, how the church doesn't look, you know. I yes. it said that there was a man. It, it could well be. I think he... Uh, it's certainly a good illustration. It was a good illustration, but uh, I, a lot of people, reason people believe that is because they said it, he was there was a man. Right, right. There might be a man, or there could be a man. Good point. Real good point. So, did the is it possible the uh, man have eternal life already? You know, he kept the commandments. So, and the, what makes it iffy, now when we get over to Luke, and, man, here, uh, oh, Luke, yeah, the Luke 10, 25, one of the references I gave you, when the lawyer said that, and he gave him some different commandments, or I mean, the, the lawyer replied, Looking at the commandments differently, he he quoted, uh, you know, more of a summary, but he included the first and second commandment, which Jesus did not to this guy. So, you know, it's one of those things that it spelled out more in uh, the the New Testament over in Romans. But listen to what Ezekiel 18 says. If he walks in my statutes and my ordinances so as to deal faithfully, he is righteous and will surely live, declares the Lord God. So, there, you know, there's that relationship as Wes brought out. Uh, I think there's a broader reach for eternal life than what we assume sometimes. Okay? Because uh, some of the uh, places or church services I've been in decades ago had a pretty narrow definition of eternal life. If you didn't come to church and say the sinner's prayer, you're going to hell. I mean, that was pretty much it in a nutshell. I can't see that in Scripture. I can't see that with this lawyer. You know, now did he keep them? Or did the young man keep them? You know, that's that's another issue, but this is what Jesus is replying. Okay. So let's go to number three here. The third one. What else is there besides eternal life? And our passage for that um, Matthew 5 um, this is where he uh, you know he goes on and, and he says uh, excuse me get my thoughts back together here and young man uh, back in Matthew 19 young man said all these things I've kept what am I still lacking so the implication here, if you look at just what's been said so far, 
I've done all of that. So is he saying what else is there besides eternal life? Or I feel like, you know, I've been doing this and I feel like I'm missing something. You know, it's like, eh, it's, there, there's something else. There's something else. And you think about us here. What, what our position is. The fact that you're here in Sunday school says something about you're probably not concerned about your eternal life. You're probably concerned more about your relationship with the Lord. You're concerned about other, you know, as, as Wes said, you know, that relationship. Want more. We want something more. So, what else is there besides eternal life? That, that's the question. I think it's a very valid one. He felt he liked something. Why, why are you here? You know, if you've got a relationship with, with the Lord, or if you, you know, you, you feel um, righteous, and I shouldn't, righteous is the word I want. Um, you made your peace with God. You know, you, you, you're, uh, you feel comfortable, confident that you're going to heaven when you die. You know, honestly, if you throw, and I'm, I'm really stirring the pot here. We've got a lot of dirt in the water. Um, if you look at the passage where he says, my righteous one shall live by faith, if I honestly believe I'm going to heaven when I die, won't I go? You know, I mean, you see what I'm saying? I mean, there's a lot of nuances here. And so I think we want to maybe keep a little bit of an open mind on some of this because if I honestly believe that, I don't know. Where we get hung up is there's more. There's more. And that's what most, uh, especially the New Testament, what most of the New Testament's about. It's not about getting eternal life. It's not about what we call in the church being saved. It's about a deeper relationship. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about, you know, obeying Jesus. And next week we're going to do talk about disciples. When we'll get even deeper into that particular point. So, what about this? So, uh, one of these ought to be working pretty good by now. What else is there besides eternal life? There's rewards. Okay. Maybe everyone would receive some reward, but there is definitely more. Definitely. Rewards. The rewards. disciples will sit in the throne with Jesus and judge <coughs> the tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes, right. Twelve thrones. Who the twelfth one is, I'm not real sure. But he knows. So, yes, Janice. When you say more, what more is there than eternal life? One, it's, it's eternal life. It brings you peace. It brings an assurance that now I'm in a relationship with the Father. I'm His child. That I'm in a larger community um, okay. of believers. That it's, I have, you know, people say I'm, I feel I'm all alone. If we stop and think, we have brothers and sisters all over that are, are you know, um, I don't know. Does this just, catch it pretty much? Family, relationship yeah. with family, with a father and with... With people, yeah. Yeah, we okay. Have, we have right. all those things. And, and some we talk eternal... I know my position with Christ is assured. My position right. is we're, assured. Right. But, we're, then, but we're, yeah, we're saying, is there, is there anything else? And, and I, the answer could be no. Oh, yeah, it's how I live. When I look at those who get the voice of my life, when I look at their, 
their peace and their complete assurance in the Lord and their trust in him that they could face an enemy and face continuous beating. I want that. Okay. This is what the church in the United States and the Western countries need. We need to be able to express our faith, to live our faith, to be bold like in that story you read. Mm -hmm. um, to stand so, firm in the face of the enemy and not, but do it in the love. And I think for me now it's that walking out that love part. That's to me, the challenge, where the, the love, the love for the person. Right, but we're talking, you know, the the but the advantage, not the challenge, but the advantages to you're going to heaven when you die. So what else? You know, he yeah. said he's poured out that love. Now, how am I going to express it? How am I going to release that love? Right, but you're you're moving in, into a different area there. <laughs> it, you know, as we look at what. What advantage? I'm going to heaven when I die. What else is there? And you, you're right. There's challenges. There's challenges. There's what else is there? What what else do you see? What else? Uh... There's a difference between being a son and being a child. Okay, I like that. One. That, that's a good, a real good point. Son versus child, grow up and mature. That's what that, uh, that, that word, who oh, it's in the Luke, I think, about, uh, you know, his, his money being perfect. Um, okay. So, there's rewards. We know there's rewards in heaven. There's family, relationship, uh, being a son versus a child. That has a lot to do with how we're treated, doesn't it? And how we treat others. Okay. Um, how about this one? Um, moving down. Does everyone, and Donna mentioned rewards. Does everyone... And when I say I put everyone have treasure or rewards in heaven, actually I should have been more specific for not thinking in terms of thinking in terms of people that are believers. Okay. Does everyone have rewards in heaven? And are they the same rewards? I heard a no. Does anybody disagree? Okay. All right. So, uh, if he gave away his uh, wealth, he would have a treasure in heaven. What What else do you see with that particular part? And then. Uh, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24, he says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth. In verse 20, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. And I think 21 is kind of the key to that. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That makes sense? Do you lock the door on anything you don't care about? Or do you lock the door on... <laughs> it reminds me of a... Years ago, probably 1970, down in Sacramento at the Air Force Base, a guy came driving in and he arrived at work about the same time. He parked way out in the parking lot. Where'd you park out there? He said, it's a new car. I don't want anybody slam the door into it or anything. They said, after a year or two, I'll park closer. But right now, it's a new car. I'm parking out here, right? I don't mind walking, because it's a new car. 
you know, what's, what's important? Right. And that's kind of the idea here, the treasures in heaven. Uh, and we, we have this incident. Let me read to you. Um, this is Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Now at this point, he's speaking to, uh, and actually, I think, I can't remember if this is the disciples only or if this is the crowd. But uh, Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Not because of your own actions, but because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, the things we do can uh, come with, uh, uh, you know, rewards. And there's a, a commentary I ran across that I thought had something to do with this. Uh, the commentary said on this passage of scripture, in God's kingdom, every action has a corresponding effect. And the idea of quantity hardly enters into the relationship of the relation of such cause and effect. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me, you know, we we have things that we we gain, and we tend to think in terms of God's rewards. But if he, to some extent, the way God has it set up is really that you reap what you sow. You do good, you get good back. You only you get more back than what you put into it. So does God reward that or is that something he's already put in place? Because it's if you think about it, if we think in terms of God rewarding and punishing, and, and excuse me, I'm not trying to take away now from the throne of judgment and so forth, you know, the white throne and stuff. But in general, you do bad, you're going to reap bad. Now, it does rain on the just and the unjust, so, you know, we can get into some murky waters here. But it looks, I uh, read that commentary and some other stuff, and it seemed to me that, you know, actually, the, the bottom line is our faith is in our own hands. Whether we, you know, believe Jesus or not, whether we submit to him or not, what we do determines what we have. If we submit to the Lord, we can get deeper and deeper. The, the relationship that uh, Janice brought out about the, the family, the father, the relationship and stuff, um, is kind of back to us. So the rewards going to have a lot to do with the person in it, you know, what, what you did, what you did. There's several places, Old Testament, New, we're told that you'll give account for every idle word. Another place we're told you'll give account for every deed, good or bad. I used to think, well, that's not too bad, you know, because they just the bad ones. Uh, you know, leave those alone, we're okay. But you do, and especially the idle word, that one bothers me sometimes because what does God consider an idle word? You know, I like to joke around, tease. And ask the Lord about that. At this point, I'm okay, but uh, he may lower the boom on me on that because he has, there's other things we're, he and I are working on at the time, okay? Not that that might not come. So, um, rewards, treasure in heaven, depends on what we do. Let's um, continue. Uh, we'll, 
when we come back next week, I want to stop here and hand out the handout for next week about being a disciple. But we come back next week. Let's spend a little bit more time on this and, and break it down some. And any uh, insight, we've just covered the, the eternal life points here. So other insight you have, and we come back, like Janice, give you a chance to kind of expand on some of that. Um, I'd like for you to really consider that first verse, you know, in our text, the first verse, when he says, he, he says, teacher, a good teacher, look at how Jesus responds to that particular thing. Also look at what he says, what shall I do? It kind of takes away from the faith part, doesn't it? You know, but there's some things like this that I'd like for us to take a look at, all right? So spend some time on that. Amen.